Do you uh, remember what you need to of my uh, career? Chicago, Yale, Rutgers, and uh, Utah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, not going to worry about the years. Probably just as well. <laughs> you know what? Time to go to the bathroom before I'm going to start. Good idea. Hey. Hey. Oh. I have to run out like 15 minutes early. Like okay, I guess that's okay. Go deal with kids, Bob. <laughs> just didn't want you to think I was going to be disinterested. Uh, there's someone always in the bathroom, right, when you need it right before. Yeah. You know the other one. Questionnaire that I you sent it. So I, I was asked to read it, so I wrote down some information. So you and I should sit down, and I haven't even seen the questionnaire. So you and I should sit down, and I can give you what his responses were. So, but I probably don't know all the responses that he would have made. Uh, but maybe we can add him in some way. So maybe, maybe tomorrow, could I find you? Then? See tomorrow's Friday. Should be able to. <laughs> we don't have a lightning to uh, HDMI adapter, do we? I should. Is that like colloquium specific? No, this is everything. Ah, because the biggest thing was I. I have that issue with the iPad, but I'd like to use it tonight uh, separately. So I was just going to put my laptop on VGA and. Uh, it's the thin one that goes into iPad. So it just has a little blade. Oh, right. You said iPad. Sorry. I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's the old iPad, not the not the new iPad. So, okay. Uh, well, I'm just going to swap out the VGAs then. It's a few second swap, but I'm only planning to do it once. So. Now, now that's a, but that, no, this is the, that's the display port, not lightning or whatever they, I think it's lightning is what they call that adapter. We should probably get one of those too because I could have given the talk on the iPad for that. 
What? Don't worry about lights. Everyone is able oh, okay. to see. Yeah. Stand up and talk. Right. Uh, yeah, I have worse problems when I teach. <laughs> Avoiding the cords. Especially if I desire to plug in my computer. Lights. Why don't we have, you know, this is the closest to that, but, you know. It'd be nice if this one had a power. But then it wouldn't be so mobile. What? Yeah. I think most of the time it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, she has it there. I have no time to go back to my office. <laughs> K plus. K plus, excuse me. And um, <laughs> <we're behind. laughs> it makes a difference. <laughs> and then he, he later studied K zero decays too. And um, then uh, followed up um, that experiment by going to Rutgers and studying K zero meson. And um, when the series of CAN experiments at Fermilab ended, it was really just came to a crashing halt. So uh, we, like other people, were wondering what to do next. So Doug and I decided to go into cosmic rays, which uh, we thought would be a fertile field, and it has been. And um, so we started collaborating with the cosmic ray group here. And of course, in those days, the important thing in cosmic rays was the GZK, GZK cutoff. Was it there or not? And so um, Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they all know the answer already, though. <laughs> and so uh, we, we, we're, we're, we took a lot of data, and uh, Charlie Ray and Tarek Abuzayad, where's Tarek, and Ben Stokes uh, worked on the analysis of the Hi-Riz-1 detector. Doug analyzed the data from the Hi-Riz-2 detector, and uh, graduates, another graduate student a graduate student and I worked on the um, Monte Carlo for that. And we put it all together, and there was, in front of us was, whoops, I can't tell you. And, we'll see uh, it. There was the GZK cutoff. So 
of like a sore thumb. And um, in trying to understand what was going on, Doug started fitting the data. And so that he, are you going to show fits today? Yeah. And so, so he fit the data, and that process has been going on by theorists and by other experimentalists in, uh, since, since then. And he developed a, you can show the. Yeah. Pointers right there. Okay, so he, de he developed a new way of looking at the, at the data, which um, was very, very interesting, and people in the ocean experiment didn't know about it. <laughs> and uh, so that has gotten him a cer certain amount of fame and notoriety, and now here he is, and he's going to tell us about um, the spectrum of conflict rates. Thank you. Oh, yeah, so... Uh, I am going to speak about the spectrum. There, uh, our, our group here, of course, does other things besides spectrum. And I've been involved in some of that, too. It may come up a little bit here, but I also wanted to leave uh, something for John to talk about next time. So you'll hear soon about other parts of our program. But uh, I'm going to talk about the spectrum. And so to start, I thought I'd, I'd go through a, a really short history, kind of light on the theory, actually. but. Uh, so, as we all uh, remember, there was a big hoopla last summer about the 100th anniversary of the discovery of cosmic rays by Hess in, in 1912. And what Hess did, he, he measured the ionization rate of air at the ground, and then he measured it going up in a balloon to 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, meters. But, you know, I don't think he went to 10,000 meters, but later people did. And he found, much to the surprise of everyone at the time, that the ionization rate w went higher as you got, went further up in the air, which meant that whatever was ionizing the air was coming down from above, not coming up from the Earth, which had been previously what had thought. And I should mention the, the energy scale for ionization meant that there's something happening at the, the MeV scale, because that's typically what you need for ionizing. You don't need that much to ionize, but the particles that do ionize tend to be MeV scale things. So move on a few years. And it wasn't known what the cosmic rays were until Rossi came and had a good idea of how to measure two Geiger counters going at once. He came up with the, the coincidence circuit that we've used so much since in high energy physics and everywhere. And that allowed him to determine that if, if I put two Geiger counters vertically and make sure they both go off at the same time, I know that one particle went through both. Then if I move one to the east, now I can see whether there's some coming from the east. I can move one to the west, or the top one to the west. I can see how many are coming from the west. And it turns out more come from, I don't remember which it is, east or west, but there's a difference, uh, which means that the, charged the cosmic rays are charged particles. So he was able to demonstrate that. There, the reason you get a difference is that Earth has a magnetic field, and it deflects them one way or, or the other. Uh, the fact that they're charged also means that other people found examples of new charged particles. Uh, Anderson actually was involved in both finding the positron in cloud uh, chamber photographs uh, because it bent the wrong way compared to an electron. He also found the muon explicitly, uh, pictures of the muon as a heavy electron. It didn't bend enough uh, for given its charge and ionization rate. Uh, so a few years after that, using using Geiger counters again and, and Rossi's uh, coincidence circuit, uh, uh, Pierre Auger found that, in fact, uh, not only do you have single particles, but you have whole sets of particles that all come at the same time. Uh, he did that. You know, If you line up two of your Geiger counters, you can say, oh, one particle went through two of those. But if you have a third somewhere else, not in the same line, then that must be a new particle. And you can say, oh, I'm going to put it out here a meter away. I get some rate. Oh, look, we have showers. I can put it 10 meters away and say, oh, it can't be that big. But there are particles there, too. I can go to 100 meters. There are still particles that coincident in 100 meters. So you can think, well, I have these MeV particles going through, ionizing. And I, I have the same shower 100 meters away. comes from the same thing. All in between, there must also be particles. And so you, you can think, you can do the calculation, well, there must be millions of particles at least. And so we've now jumped the energy scale, not from MeV, but up to 
I guess that one million there would only get me to TV, but when he did the full calculation, he found that they should be 10 to the 15th EV involved in all those particles added up. And that sort of changed the whole idea of what cosmic rays were. Not these ionizing particles going through the air now, but charged particles hitting the Earth's atmosphere and creating these huge showers of charged particles. And so then the question became, well, <laughs> where did that come from? Here we have a, a natural process that's producing extremely high energy particles. It can't be thermal. You don't produce anything thermal that we know of that gives 10 to the 15th EV particles, even higher uh, now we know. Uh, and so what's going on? And we're still answering that question 75 years later. Uh, by the way, 38 was also the year Snow White and the Seven Dwarves first appeared in the theaters. <laughs> and the, the book of The Hobbit was first published. Uh, because of the large energies involved, uh, lots of new processes were uh, discovered, new particles, before we could produce anything like those energies in terrestrial experiments. And so the pi on the kaon and the lambda were all discovered in, in cosmic rays first because we could produce them there. Uh, and so, uh, jump forward another 30 years, uh, the cosmic microwave background had been discovered, and quickly after that, there was a prediction, well, no matter where they come from, if there has to be an end of the spectrum at around 10 to the 20th EV, because we have these microwave photons, we know how many of them are, there are everywhere in the galaxy, and for a particle at 10 to the 20th EV, that uh, very low energy uh, microwave photon appears to be a 1, MeV, a 1 GeV photon uh, to, the phot to the very high energy proton coming in, it can excite that proton, it produces a pion, and quickly loses energy over the scale of, say, tens of millions of years. That's a very short time. Uh, and so, basically, if there are any particles up there, they quickly lose energy to go down below that energy. And that's the GZK cutoff, predicted by Grison, Zetsefin, and Kuzmin in 1968. Uh, so that's the end of my short history. Uh, now I'll tell you how we actually observe cosmic rays. There's two ways. One, you can put particles on the ground, uh, detectors on the ground, and see what hits the ground. That's how we found showers originally. Or you can observe the light produced by the shower. So let me mention each of those uh, in order. So surface detectors, detecting the particles on the ground, it's really quite a simple detector, and that's why we used it first. You need a Geiger counter or something that is sensitive to ionizing radiation, and uh, you just put them out on the ground, you know, how much ever density you need, uh, and uh, look for the coincidences. Uh, the other nice thing is uh, they work all the time. You can run 100% of the time, but it's a little bit hard to interpret the data. That's because the shower comes down, it's doing a lot of things. A lot of it's getting absorbed, and I'll show you some pictures later. And at, at the ground, you're not seeing maybe the bulk of the shower. And in fact, you're probably not seeing the bulk of the shower. So you have to make a big extrapolation to, to say what the bulk properties of the shower are. However, if you look for in opt, at optical detectors, well, there you have to overcome the fact that there's a lot of light around from other sources, like the sun. So, well, OK, you go at night. Then there's the moon. Well, you wait till the moon's down. But there's still background above you have to deal with. But once you see a signal over the background, then that's actually pretty easy to interpret because the most light comes from the, from the densest part of the shower. You're really seeing the bulk properties. Uh, and so I'll make a claim, slightly controversial, though not, not at Utah particularly, that uh, <laughs> you have to have optical detectors in studying cosmic rays if you really want to know well the properties of the air shower. It's not that you can't use the surface detectors, but you've got to connect it to an optical measurement. OK, uh, let me show you a few pictures of showers. These aren't created by me. They're created by uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, who works in, in, in England at Leeds. And he created these simulations. Now, this is a, a three photon showers going from 100 GeV to 10 uh, TeV to 1 PeV. Uh, and if all uh, showers were electromagnetic. These were created by photons. 
we would have understood it even just looking at the ground. And you can see basically uh, 100 GeV shower. Are here, it, yeah. What is the x-axis? Uh, there's no x-axis here. Uh, I mean, each picture is is about five kilometers from the center to the edge. So it's it's just position. These showers are vertical. It's it's 30 kilometers from top to bottom with with a real air there. And then I've marked in certain depths. The x-axis is really like the Earth. Yeah. It's it's actual horizontal position on the Earth. Uh, so a shower comes down. All these cyan particles are electrons or photons. Uh, the actual photon interacted right at the top. And the shower develops. You can see lots of particles. Uh, in the center there, you can see it gets white. That means that there's a lot more particles there than everywhere else. And that's the bulk of the shower. And you can see that as the shower develops, the average energy goes down. Eventually, you can't produce any more shower. Nothing hits the ground. Uh, as you go up in energy, some particles hit the ground, and more and more, and this brightest part gets deeper and deeper. So if we only had photon showers, we would have been able to understand it, because we understand QED. We understand how electrons and photons interact. There's no reason to think it changes as you go to very high energies. But what we actually have is a proton coming in, and you can see it doesn't look anything like what we had before. Even at the lowest energy, you can see separate hadrons break into these separate showers. And exactly how they're distributed side to side is hard to predict. In 1938, they had no idea about QCD. I mean, they hardly even knew nuclear physics yet to know how, you know, they, they knew about protons. They had just discovered the neutron. They didn't understand that protons weren't primary particles, so they wouldn't understand how they break up and, and things like that. Uh, by the way, in this pic picture, the blue lines here are muons. They're actually magenta on top of cyan. So this magenta line there is, is a muon. There's some down here. Uh, you can see there's a lot of muons down there. And the other thing you have to understand is how many muons there are. And we, c we still can't predict that. This is the reason that we need a an optical source to, to, uh, to say what's happening at the ground. Yes, Dave. Uh, well, this is a model, so uh, the model knew, and it drew them in a different, and the picture was made drawing them in a different color. So, so this model, of course, they know exactly how many muons there are, but there's some, cho there's some choice in that model. And actual data, we don't know that we know the number of muons to the number of electrons properly. But we have to know it properly in order to really understand what's happening at the ground. Uh, and depending on your detector design, you can make yourself more or less sensitive, but you're always a little bit sensitive to that. Uh, if I compare the electron and pho the, the proton shower and the uh, photon shower side by side, you'll also notice the proton is much wider. And in fact, when Auger discovered uh, shower, uh, extensive showers in 1938, they went out to 200 or 300 meters, and nobody thought it should be that wide. They thought it should be as wide as a photon shower. So what Auger really discovered was hadronic air showers, which is the bulk of them. OK, let me talk about experiment. I'm not really a theorist. Uh, I'm not a theorist, sorry. I should not, it really doesn't have anything to do with it. So let me talk about an experiment, since I am an experimentalist. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the experiments I worked on. And so the first one, cosmic ray experiment I worked on, high res. It was a second generation experiment, the first being fl just fly's eye. Uh, but I jumped to high res because that's what I worked on. Uh, and so it ran 1997 to 2006. It had two sites. I'm going to show you pictures uh, to see stereo. And it had one degree pixels and five square meters. The real high res part of the high resolution flies eye is the smaller pixels. Flies eye had five meter pixels, uh, five degree pixels, and bigger mirrors by a factor of two or four uh, in area. OK, so some pictures from high res. Uh, high res 1 is on a mountain, granite, little granite mountain on Dugway. High res 2 is, is 12 kilometers away. At each of those sites, we have mirrors that look like this. Uh, and at the focal plane of that mirror is a cluster of PMTs. Each one of those PMTs is shown. You can see it in the reflection in the mirror. Is, is about uh, an inch across and sees a pixel. So uh, a pixel is one degree on the sky. So each one of these PMTs sees one degree on the sky. 
Uh, so here's the two sites. Salt Lake City's way off over there. And here's high res 1 and high res 2. And at 10 to the 18th electron volts, we expect enough light from the shower to see out to about 10 kilometers. And so you can see if I draw a circle around each site, 10 kilometers, I have a small overlap where I can see events in stereo. It's not very big compared to the rest of the area. So I not only want to see in stereo, I want to use all the events that come over here. And I'll show you later how that area comes in. If I move up an order of magnitude and energy, I see out twice as far. Uh, and now I have a large stereo area. It's, it's the majority of the total area. So we measured the spectrum each side independently using a monocular reconstruction. I'll show some pic pictures of TA of how I do that. Uh, and in stereo, uh, and they all agree with each other. And here is the GZK cutoff that was so obvious that Gordon mentioned. Well, when we first saw it, it wasn't quite so obvious. We had to you know, get a lot of data before then. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you how we make that determination. First thing we do is we, uh, we fit the, the data. This is just the two monocular sites. We fit it to a broken power law, which doesn't make any physical sense, but is useful for characterizing the spectrum. So there are three uh, sections. And we, we allow the breakpoints to, to move and the slopes of the uh, power loss to change. And the actual values that I got from that fit are shown there. Uh, that doesn't tell you much yet. What we really wanted to answer first was how, how significant is that drop there? You can see the error bars. They're there. They're not insignificant. So how significant is that? And we do that just by extending this line up to higher energy. And we know how many, then given that flux, how many do, events do we expect? And then we compare it to the number that we actually saw. And when we do that, we get a five sigma uh, significance uh, above that break point. I should go back uh, above this point where the break happens. We count up those events. We get something like 12 or 13. And we expected something like 40 or 50. Yes? Hey, Doug. So this is a naive question that I, I never thought to ask before. But how do you know that this cutoff has to do with this process of interaction with the photons and not just with the fact that at some high energy they I'm going to answer that question right? yeah you can't entirely eliminate that possibility you can only say that for protons we would expect a cutoff just at this energy and that's what I'm going to show but you know there could be a coincidence between the end of the production spectrum and the propagation that you know, you, you would have to design some other kind. However, if there was a coincidence, the slopes might not match. You, you, would, you could do, maybe do some clever thing to, to distinguish. I have a related question. Yeah. I mean, if I just look at this data and don't know yep. anything about uh, GZK cutoff, uh, it looks to me like it, it's coming down a bit, but uh, not, not necessarily cutting off, because I see a whole bunch of points uh, that are not going down, right. that, that are plateauing. Right. So the cutoff is, is a bit of a misnomer, uh, because the, the cutoff, I'll actually show pictures of how it cuts off. Close by, it hasn't had enough time to propagate through and lose all the energy yet. So there's some close by parts. And, and so you expect it not to be a sharp cutoff, but to, to, to come in in stages. So the cutoff is, is a bit of a strong statement. And I'll actually show an uh, illustration of all those things in a second. Uh, to answer your question, what do you expect? You can, with the model, you can predict where the flux drops to half of what you would have expected without the effect. And that's what Brzezinski did. Uh, and the way you do it is you, you, this is the same spectrum, but now I've, I've, it's an integral spectrum. Each one of these points is the flux of cosmic rays above that energy, not just in some energy bin. And the lines I put on before, I've also integrated from the start, from whatever point it is, up to 10 to the 21. I stop here. That's why that one bends over. And then I take the, the ratio of the two and see where it drops to half. And uh, that's what we call E1 half, the energy where the flux drops to half of what you would expect with no effect of anything. And then you say, well, what, what do we expect with proton propagation through the cosmic microwave background, and you expect 
you know, 19.72, we measure 19.74, plus or minus like 0.06. So we agreed very well, a little bit better than you can expect, but not, un, not unseemly better. Uh, so this is the work that I did. I, I also did a propagation model uh, where you just start with a, a, a source with some arbitrary spectrum. It has e to the minus 2.7. Oh, I forgot to say all along, these spectrums look very horizontal, but in fact, they're dropping very, very, very steeply at approximately e to the minus 3. Well, you can't see anything then, so you have to multiply by e cubed. Every point, uh, every bin, you multiply the flux there by its energy cubed. And then things flatten out, and you can see structure. Well, that's true here too. So if I start with a, a source that has, say, e to the minus 2.4, and I multiply by e to the cubed, then I get something that is e to the... 0.6, I guess. So it's going up. So that's what I put in here. So I take all the, the, part of the, all the sources that might be at some z, say z equals 0.01, which is a fair distance away, something like 100 megaparsecs. And, uh, and then I say, OK, I have a, a model for how many sources there are in, in some shell at that z. I add up all their, their flux. I know what its spectrum is, e to the minus 2.4. And then I propagate it through to me here, the right amount of time later. And what I'll find is that if I started with a line that goes up like that, I, I get this line. And all the, all the particles that I would have created here have piled up in this little pile there. And you see there, there's a little pile there. If I go further back, say 0.1, now I'm talking hundreds of megaparsecs away, uh, I have nothing up there. It's all gone down below. And what's more, I have a little dip here caused by not creating pions, but electron pairs, electrons and positrons. So the threshold's lower because there's not that much energy. But you still lose energy, and you can calculate what it is. Uh, and so I can add up all those shells, and I would get this red line. Notice. If I'm very close, there's, no, there's hardly any effect, right? So here I am very close. There's a little bit of a reduction there, but hardly noticeable. But there's still some amount of sources if I assume they're uniformly distributed. Uh, if I add up the actual colored lines there, I get this red line. You see that there's some dips and wiggles. Those are artifacts of the binning that I used. But if I use many more shells, I get the black line. And, and that's one model prediction for a spectrum. And then I can fit the high-res data to that. And what I've actually fit is this red line. I had to assume that there was some galactic part going away. Now, they all recover here. So the fact that high-res keeps going up means that there has to be some other component coming in there. And, and it's long been expected that the galactic portion, iron if it is, uh, is going away. And so we had some model for what that was. We added them together. We got a good fit. This feature here, known as the ankle, then is really explained by electron-positron pair production from proton protonic cosmic rays in this model. So high res uh, did measure the GZK cutoff with 5 sigma. And we have a spectrum that's consistent with protons being all of the extragalactic cosmic rays as well. What is the, I mean, you said you fit it. What is the free parameter that you're fitting? Two free parameters. One is the input slope. In this case, it, the slope was 2.38. The other is the, um, the rate, the, how much I weight the shells. So as I go back in time, how many there are, that's the evolution parameter. And so it's like 1, Z, 1 plus z to the 2.55 uh, is the, the number of sources uh, per you know, volume in that shell. Um, how many events uh, did you have per flux data points that you um, that of course on the higher end? Uh, well, so I think there's, there's two events in each of those bins, mm -hmm. uh, one in this one. And then you can see here we're getting hundreds of events. Yeah, Kyle. One could assume in the previous slide that your shells, the amplitude of each shell, is basically representative of the 
come with a big number density of yeah. galaxies at that rate. Right. So you can actually use a galaxy evolution model for this. Right. I think I think that was actually the idea uh, was that, and I'm not sure. So at the time, I, I was a little confused about co-moving densities and things, uh, but that's basically the idea. Uh, you know, so how how high each one of these lines is as you go back basically depends on how many sources there are there. But you've just parameterized by this the z of the alpha. Parameter. Yeah, right. One one plus z to the alpha, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Has, has anybody ever looked at a if, if you can get higher precision measurement on each of these uh, bins and energy to actually? Yeah. People are still fitting this, and, and actually I'll show some of our more recent, well, I'll, I'll allude to a, a more recent attempt to do this. Uh, but yeah. basically, we don't have much better precision yet. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that and the whole thing is, what is this green line? That's, that's the hard part. Here it's kind of ad hoc, but I also notice that the red and the black agree very well to about here. And I'll, I'll point, to, point to that later. And somewhere between here and here, you have to have something else. And there's more data for that that I'll get to. OK, so, uh, so that was high res. Now I'm going to talk about TA, which is primarily what uh, I've been, you know, I'll talk about the surface detector measurement and then my own uh, analysis efforts. Uh, so. Telescope array is a hybrid detector. It has both uh, fluorescence detectors like high res and surface detectors. It's not bad to have surface detectors, but it, you need to have the fluorescence with them. Uh, and it's a successor to both high res and Agassa, which I haven't mentioned, but they were a competing experiment to high res. And uh, so it's, uh, we have a surface array, each surface detector station, three square meters of scintillator separated by 1.2 kilometers on a square grid. And then fluorescence te telescope is very similar to high res. And so let me show you a picture. So each one of these red uh, squares represents one of our detectors. Uh, and you see there's 507 of them spaced over about uh, 700 square kilometers. And then there's three fluorescence sites. They don't look all around in a circle. They only look over the detector because we want to have the overlap. Now, 700 square kilometers may not mean much, so I decided to show you how big this is by moving it to Salt Lake. So here's what it looks like over the top of Salt Lake. And you see it perfectly fits in the Salt Lake Valley. Here's, here's uh, you know, uh, point of the mountain down there, and we're up here at this end. And basically it fills the valley just about perfectly. So that gives you the scale side of the, scale of the experiment. Uh, so the surface detectors look like this. So there's three square meters of scintillator in this box. This is 1.2 kilometers. There you see the next one along. Yeah, actually, Tom is pointing out this is more than 1.2 kilometers. It's 1.2 times the square root of 2 because we're looking diagonally. Uh, and oh, that picture is not very good. Um, two fluorescent sites. Uh, the northern one, middle drum, looks like this. Uh, the two southern ones were built new. Uh, they look like that, though it's a little hard to see because that ended up kind of pixelated. Um, if this looks a lot like the high res mirror, you're right, it is. Uh, the whole middle drum site was made of high res mirrors, so it's very similar to high res. And in fact, we use that to our advantage in, in making a connection, direct connection to, to high res. So I'm going to first talk about the surface detector spectrum and how we do the analysis there. So. You'll have a bunch of coincident hits in your, in your scintillators, uh, and that's the footprint of the shower on the ground uh, shown here. So the colors of these things represent when they came. Uh, the size represents how many charged particles went through that detector. Uh, and you can find the center of, what, of mass of all those, which is somewhere close to that star. Uh, and the primary axis and the direction it's moving is given by the arrow. Uh, now, you can do better than, than that just weighted average. Uh, you, can, you can fit the time and the shape of this wavefront uh, to find the best position. And here's, an, here's the fit for this event of the time. So you're moving along in position along that arrow, 
and you see the time changes, and uh, you expect you know, some curvature to, this, to the wave front. And as you move off the axis, you get these lines. And, and you can find a very good core position of the shower. Once you have the core position, which is the star, you can say, well, I have this amount of uh, this density of charged particles so far away. And that's given by the points here. You fit that to a function to find what is the density of particles at 800 meters of the shower. That's what we used. That's almost proportional to the energy. But we don't use the law of proportionality. We make a lookup table. So if you say, oh, I had uh, 3,000 particles per square meter, uh, then I, I'm going to have an energy in here. And my angle was, well, my se the secant of my angle, say, is 1.2. Then I know that I have a shower that's something like 10 to the 19th EV. And so that's how we find the energy, except We've left out the optical part of it. And in fact, one has to adjust that to, for all those particles seen by the fluorescence detectors, to make their energies agree. And you have to make a 27% correction. Uh, once you make that 27% correction, you see that you have a very good agreement between the energy seen in the fluorescence detectors and that which is given here, and the energy seen in the op in the surface detector. <coughs> so the spectrum that came out of that, shown here, uh, you see that we have now much more statistics than uh, we had in high res. Here, we had 5.7 sigma in only five years, as opposed to the eight or nine years that took high res. And you might think, well, we have a lot more data. It should have gone faster than five years. Uh, and I have an answer for that, which is that it's not really appropriate anymore to talk about a breakpoint there. It, it has some shape that's not well approximated by, uh, by a power law. Uh, that same spectrum compared to Agasa that I mentioned uh, shows you the importance of, of having an, a, a fluorescence detector. Uh, the real difference between these is that uh, the, the overall normalization of those two is that we had an optical detector to say what's the, the you know, the bolometric measurement of energy from that shower. Uh, you know, we have a real calorimetric measurement. You know, we see the energy deposit. Rather than counting events at the bottom, we have to make an adjustment for that. Uh, Auger has a different issue, which is they use a different fluorescence yield measurement. However, they're making corrections that make this go nearly to us anyway. So, uh, Also notice, so the black points here are directly on top of the high res 1 and 2 uh, measurement that I showed before. So we measure the same now as we, we did then. We have better statistics, but the overall level is the same, which is, is heartening. So uh, I went quickly through the SD analysis because I want to get to the mono analysis that I've done, but let me say a few more words about it. Uh, so as I mentioned, you, you need the FD to normalize the SD uh, energy scale. That's because we don't know the physics at 10 to the 20th EV of a proton hitting uh, a nitrogen atom, or an iron hitting a, a nucleus hitting a, a nitrogen atom. We don't know what the transverse energy scale of that is, what the multiplicity of that is, well enough to say what particles hit the ground. Uh, but we can correct if, but the total amount of energy deposited in the atmosphere doesn't depend on that. That depends on how much energy you started with. So when we see in fluorescence some amount of light, it really represents the energy. And so we have to use fluorescence to, to normalize the SD. Uh, and, and so that's the problem Agassa had, as I mentioned. Uh, and I mentioned OJ. Uh, so given that we're so dependent on this fluorescence, we have to also go and, and do the, the, the calculation. What's the spectrum from? Uh, the fluorescence data by itself. So the statistics, are, of course, are lower. I can only run, we can only run fluorescence 10% of the time the SD is running. Uh, but we can also go further down in energy. Uh, fluorescence, monofluorescence, uh, also thoroughly probes the instrument. We have to account for many things, get them right in order for our measurement to, to work. Uh, and we're finally, we're, the shape of the spectrum has to match. We're not just normalizing an average now. We're going to look at a shape. So uh, here's my group. 
uh, Tom is there. Sean is a student at Rutgers who recently graduated a year ago. Uh, John's just joined us. Lauren Scott was postdoc before Tom. And Saskia worked with us both at Rutgers and here. So the steps of the analysis, right? So fluorescence, you can see the shower. And that's important. So here's the image of the shower in the, in the mirror. Uh, the shower moves across this way. The time is, re again, represented by the color. And it grows and it shrinks. Um, by knowing that time, uh, I can fit that time uh, for a particle moving at the speed of light. And I find that it mostly moves, it has a linear relation between time and angle. But there's a slight curvature. And from that curvature, I measure what its angle in the plane is. Uh, now, I, once I have this and that, I know where it is, how far away it is, what angle it is. I can say that point there gave me so much light. Let me adjust my shower and see how I can best match what I did see. And when I do that, I, I take various components. Uh, fluorescence is shown by the red line. There's a, a, a lot of light uh, that's in a Cherenkov beam around the shower. It scatters. That gives me the green light, uh, the green here. And I add it up in each of my measurements. Each photomultiplier tube measures so many light, and I just match those. Uh, then I can say, well, if I saw that much light here, it must have been from so many particles out in the shower. And then finally, I have the number of particles in the shower. And the number of particles in the shower is pretty much directly related to the energy uh, of the shower itself. So, this is actually re representing a measurement of the energy of that shower. Um, so to do all that, I have to simulate all those processes I just mentioned, the light coming to us, reflecting, hitting a photomultiplier tube. Uh, there's some time scale there. I have to take that into account. I have to say how, I'm, how my trigger to get events affects the, the rate I get. So, I spent a lot of time in the last five to eight years writing this simula simulation called Trump. And that's all very complicated. But in fact, the, the initial shower is pretty simple, fortunately. It's just basically a point particle moving through the air uh, whose intensity changes. And I just take, it, uh, take that. I have a, a form for how that is. But the total of that, if I integrate it, gives me the energy. Uh, it's all nice to have a model. But it's only when you compare what that model produces to reality that you believe it. And so it wouldn't be a talk given by me about cosmic rays if I didn't show how well this does. And because I always show how well it does, you might think, oh, it's easy. It takes a lot of work to get these, these right. So <laughs> as, and that's why it's taken, you know, I've been working on it for five years. So of course, after that, it, it works well. But a lot of work goes into this. So how far away are showers? That's the first thing you have to get right if you want to know, uh, you know how to interpret the number of particles you, you got. You have to say, well, they came in a certain area. Flux has a 1 over meter squared in it. So I have to know how far away they are. So the red histogram here, the blue histogram here, are the two sites, Black Rock and Long Ridge. The data is given by the black points. Here, for in three energy ranges, uh, 1 times 1 to 3 EEV, 3 to 10 EEV, and above 10 EEV. And as the shower gets brighter, I can see it further away. And we see that uh, we go from about 10 kilometers to 15 kilometers to 20 kilometers. So yes, I can see further away. And I reproduce the shape in each case. So I think that I see showers the right distance away. Now I also have to see showers at the right set of angles, because my, uh, my flux is going to be per meter squared and per stair radian. So I have to get the right angles. Uh, so here's the distribution of angles in the plane. Uh, and so they agree, again, I have three energy bins and Black Rock and, and Long Ridge. Finally, the shower has a certain brightness. But the brightness that I see also depends on my simulation a lot. So I'm also going to compare the brightness of the shower as I see it. That's the number of photoelectrons uh, divided by the length of the shower. Uh, and that's what's shown in, in these two cases. 
Here I haven't broken it up by bins because a, a, a low energy shower close to me is as bright as a far energy shower far away. Uh, you know, with some, uh, so it doesn't make as much sense to break that up into energy bins. And uh, again, we have good agreement. And here, in fact, I've, I've divided uh, the data by the Monte Carlo to look for small changes. So I can, if I have a slight shift in this, I'm going to get a slope in this, in this ratio. And in fact, I have a slight slope here, but it's, it's small enough that, that uh, it doesn't create a huge effect later on. Here, I have no significant slope at all. A lot of what we do is, is trying to make sure these slopes are small enough. So believing my Monte Carlo, I can calculate how much area, how much solid angle do I see at a given energy. And that's what's shown down here, Black Rock and Long Ridge. Seeing when one site only sees it are given by the points here. If both sites see it, then I have this aperture. I add all those three together, and I get this, the black points here, which I can fit to a phenomenological form, just a, an exponential uh, growth to a, a given size there. I've also included the time that I've been running, so it's kilometer squares and steradians and seconds in that. And then I have my data in the same kind of binning. I add up all these, divide by that, and that gives me the flux. And that flux is given here. And you see, we again see the ankle. And uh, well, not a very strong cut here, but uh, at least I measure a reduction. Oh, and let me point out, that was just published this summer. So. Uh, now I want to compare what did the SD see, what did the FD mono see. I've also combined the data from Middle Drum, which I haven't talked about. Doug Rodriguez published his thesis on that a few years ago. Uh, he was a student here uh, working with Charlie. Uh, that's combined in these, in these red points with what I showed just now. And you see that when we compare it to the SD spectrum, it agrees very well in shape with maybe that one point being a little low. But that's actually only you know, one and a half sigma off or something. It's just I think it's a statistical fluctuation. So it agrees well. We've also added a few points down below 10 to the 18th. Uh, and it seems that there's no change in, in the slope from adding those two points. Uh, so that's the experimental uh, result. Uh, I wanted to talk a little more about what it means in terms of whether we still agree with it being protons coming. So Cascada Granda is an experiment that works at lower energy. In, in, they're at Karlsruhe in, in Germany. And this is their measurement of the spectrum, the black squares here that they recently published. I think they published it last summer. I should have put the reference here. But they also have a method of determining, is the shower, a particular shower, heavy or light? It's a parameter, k goes from 0 to 1. And they can, they can set it at different levels and say, OK, above that it's heavy, below that it's light, and split the data into two parts. So for instance, the, the blue squares, and I think the red triangles here, uh, are one cut. Above the cut is the blue squares. That's the heavy part. Below the cut is, the, uh, is light. It's the, the red triangles. So the idea is that, well, these are galactic cosmic rays, primarily. And the, uh, and the spectrum is coming to an end. And so it cuts off. And maybe that's what happens. There's a little break in the spectrum here, just below 10 to the 17th. Uh, and that's from iron losing steam, uh, losing its ability to be produced by galactic accelerators. The light part, you see, though, has a bend up at a higher energy. Uh, and that might be indicative of an extra galactic source now being visible. And so if we believe that what we've measured in, in uh, TA is protons, and everything we, all my calculations from high res seem to indicate that, then we should take that light part that they measured and project it up. And, and it should match here with a little dip from the propagation models. Well, Cascada Granda, they don't match that well with us. 
I, you know, there's a great deal of uncertainty. They're only a surface detector. They don't have a, an optical component. So there's some uncertainty. I'd like to move them up by a factor of two, say. And then I might get a, a reasonable uh, model. But I, we'll have to wait. But uh, I should say that the purple and the green here are just different cuts in K for that light component. But I wanted to emphasize the red one. Um, and the, the lines here are, are just drawn by hand by me, so they don't really represent a model or anything. Uh, so we can't really do anything here because we don't know the relative normalizations and energy scales of the two experiments. So it would be nice to have an experiment that was connected to TA working in this region, and that's exactly what TAIL is. So let me talk at the end of my talk about our future plans. And so TAIL is the beginning of that. So extend the range of TA down below 10 to the 17th to observe the end of the galactic component and see the extra galactic component coming in, really see that transition. Uh, so two things you need to do to change TA to allow you to see lower in energy. One, you're bring, the showers are, are lower in energy, which means if you're going to see them, they're closer to you. In fluorescence, they're going to be closer to you, which means a big thing coming closer to you, you have to look higher up to see the whole range of things. Also, uh, you just need to put your surface detectors closer together so you can trigger on, on showers that don't put as much uh, many particles out as far away. So uh, TA is now deployed, in fact, and we're now commissioning it. So I'll show a few pictures of it. So here's the TA array again, and the red circles here are the, um, are the tail uh, extension. Uh, first, there's the same spacing uh, to work as a little bridge, and then uh, the spacing gets smaller to about a third the spacing uh, as we get close to where the middle drum site is. That's also going to be an expanded fluorescence detector. Basically, you take the middle drum site as it exists and then add uh, two more rings of mirrors or two more uh, lines of mirrors looking higher in the sky, up to 60 degrees. So uh, pictures of that. Uh, here is the, well, this is the middle drum site. But all the surface detectors, the new surface detectors, staged there, ready to go, and then being deployed by a helicopter. Here's the helicopter, comes down, people attach the, the uh, surface detector to it, take it to the right place. So all of those 30-some detectors deployed in, in one day, I think, right? Yeah. And then, uh, so here's the old middle, well, here's the middle drum site. It's not that old. Uh, and we built a new building next to it. You see it's bigger, it's taller. And if you look inside the mirrors, they're, they're looking way up in the sky. They're, they're not looking out. They're, they've been tipped back and look up. The building had to be higher so that the, the roof, the edge of the door doesn't cut off your field of view. And so it's running. We're commissioning it. Here's an example of an event that went through four, the four uh, rows of, of mirrors and, uh, and also triggered the surface detector. And when you line up all the times, the black points here are the times here. And the times of those are the red points there. Uh, we're still working on the exact normal, you know, the exact offset of time between the two. Uh, so there is a little bit of a jump there, but uh, we'll work that out. And then what do we expect in terms of events? Uh, well, of events that trigger both, we expect a distribution of events that looks like this. So the bulk is in that 10 to the 17th to 10 to the 18th decade. If we just look at the surface detector by itself, we get about 10 times more. This is a log scale here, so, and so it looks a little different. But, uh, and you see that our threshold is really somewhere around 10 to the 17th or uh, 10 to the 16.7 if we want at least 10% you know, efficiency. Uh, OK, and then. I wanted myself to go even further down in energy, down to what's the feature known as the knee, which is 10 to the 15.5 EV. Uh, to do that, I have to use a different kind of light. Uh, fluorescence just isn't bright enough to see the showers that low. But there's another kind of light produced by the charged particles, and that's Cherenkov light. And it's beamed forward. And so I can see a lower energy shower just because its light is beamed forward as long as I'm in that beam. Uh, so uh, I can use that light to see lower energy showers. Uh, the size of that light pool is typically about 100 meters in radius. And 
That's unfortunate because I would need a whole lot of detectors in order to also be able to see some events with tail. Uh, and so I have to balance between spacing far enough apart to cover a large enough area with a fixed set of counters, you know, or not having so many counters that it's unaffordable, yet being able to get to the physics I want. So it turns out that if, if I use a new technique measuring the time width of particles, I can make a good measurement still uh, with 200 meter spacing. So here's my idea for, for niche. By the way, niche is non-imaging Cherenkov array. Uh, the, the circles here, the big circles are the SDs from tail. And so uh, the red ones here and the blue little dots are where I would put my Cherenkov counters. Cherenkov counter is a really simple thing. It's a photomultiplier tube looking at the sky. And now you might also want to add a Winston cone so you, you increase the area of it and define your, your angular acceptance. But that's, uh, but basically you still just have a photomultiplier tube looking at the sky. Uh, I calculated the instantaneous trigger aperture. Uh, and with my 200 counters here, I have a threshold at about uh, below 10 to the 16th, so getting down to the knee. And I expect lots of events with, with that array. Uh, so I'm applying for money for this at the moment. I have a couple of collaborators. And I also uh, just ran a workshop this summer based on that, so I thought I'd show that. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, so we've been working on measuring the spectrum of cosmic rays, ultra high energy cosmic rays, uh, specifically always connected to optical techniques by high res and TA. Uh, high res is observed the GZK cutoff. TA has confirmed that. Uh, and in particular, the spectrum is consistent with all those ultra high energy cosmic rays being protons. Uh, so extra galactic. Uh, cosmic rays being primarily protons. Uh, we're moving on. Tail will soon allow us to measure the spectrum uh, in, in the 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 18th, and maybe even below 10 to the 17th. Uh, and, uh, and then I ha am trying to build an experiment that goes down to the knee using Cherenkov. So if that all happens, then TA and tail and niche will soon uh, be observing cosmic rays all at the same time over five orders of magnitude and energy from 10 to the 15.5 to above 10 to the 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I may have missed it, but how do you, how do you get the original spectrum of particle energy from the sources? Okay, yeah, I didn't mention exactly how we do the, uh, the energy calibration, but a, so the, the part that the shower is mostly electrons at the end, no matter what you start with. About the original two point e to the minus two point oh. something or another. Uh, I don't get that. I assume it, and then it's a parameter in, in my models. Well, why do you assume that? Uh, lower energy Yeah, so lower energy experiments measure a spectrum. Also, um, the process, the model process for producing, what well, you need to have, first of all, it can't be thermal. It has to be s some acceleration mechanism. You expect a power law. And uh, the, the best explanation is uh, first order Fermi acceleration, where you have uh, turbulent magnetic fields and a moving, separate, uh, a moving boundary between them. And particles will go from the one regime to the other and be accelerated. And so each time they get some boost in energy. But they also escape with some fraction each time. And if you, in that model, the most likely uh, slope is e to the minus 2. But then you might have some containment uh, um, things changing the spectrum uh, to make it a slightly softer spectrum after that. But e to the minus 2 is, is a very natural uh, spectrum. Uh, to get out of this process. Actually, that has equal energy at all uh, energy bins. So it has to be a little steeper than e to the minus 2. So what's the story now about anisotropies or even sources? Um, so TA has, has made measurements of anisotropy. Of course, I didn't talk about that. But um, 
we have looked for correlations with the large scale structure. You know, basically where the galaxies are in the universe out to 200 uh, or 250 megaparsecs. And because you know, we have great walls and voids, that's not a uniform distribution. You can say, do our events correlate with that structure? Or do they correlate better with complete anisotropy? And you also need to go to very high energies above, you know, at around the GZK cutoff, where you, you uh, are also running out of events because of the change. However, at that highest energy, uh, we are marginally inconsistent with isotropy. Uh, so at the 95% at the, uh, confidence limit, we're not consistent with isotropy, but we are consistent with the distribution of galaxies in the, uh, in the nearby space. Um, there is also a, a spot which has more than we expect, but I'm not sure of the significance of it yet. It's a big spot. It's not, not a, a point source. So. <laughs> I would say the th well, so the threshold for a photomultiplier tube is something on order of 25 photoelectrons. And we have to have at least six tubes. Usually we have to have 10 degrees of tubes. So let's say 10. Uh, so that's 250 is about the minimum amount of photoelectrons. So 1,000 photons is the absolute minimum we could see. Uh, that's at the detector, of course. There's many more produced. Sure, sure. So that's, that's over four square meters. So humans can't see them because? Um, the light is all in, in the ultraviolet. Um, I've actually wondered for a long time because many birds have, have a pigment that sees ultraviolet, whether they, they see cosmic rays. <laughs> also, Cherenkov light should actually be visible to humans. So I wonder why we can't see. You, I know you, you s said that. If you're in orbit, you see it in your eyes. Right, but that's not the shower. I wonder if you can see showers at the ground. There was a Russian experiment that was done in the 70s where they had people in a field with coincidence counters, and they all looked at the sky. <laughs> <laughs> And it was marginally consistent with actually the rate of cosmic rays. <laughs> what happens when one fell asleep? <laughs> with his eyes like, open. Sounds like a nice thing you can count. counter. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Well, let's thank you. <laughs>
if the dark matter were much, much, much heavier than is thought, mm -hmm. so that it could, in, in decays or, or interactions, produce cosmic rays of the energy that we see, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But it, people think that it's, it's not that heavy, that it's really, you know, tens of GeV rather than uh, uh, Do we have any PEV. Idea? Okay, second question. Do we have any idea what is the origin, what is the mechanism that's responsible for the GZK cutoff? I mean, the, you know, you have models that fit it, but I don't know. The GZK cutoff, as stated, mm -hmm. that mechanism is, is rock solid. What is it? Pi n production on, so proton plus photon excites a delta resonance, and then which decays to a nuclei okay. and a pi -on. And it'll do it around the same energy, 10 to the, the 20, yeah, 10 yeah. 10 20 that, that, that part's rock solid. The, the uncertainties are, is it protons? So if it's, you if it's other protons. nuclei, then you get, then you, you, you will still get the, the nuclei breaking up and yeah. losing energy, but you don't get the electron positron dip. Mm -hmm. So you have to explain that in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and what if the production spectrum just stops there at the same energy? That's the question, yeah. So, uh, the exact way it cuts off gives you some handle on that, mm -hmm. I think. And no, if you knew it was protons, then you you could fit that slope in, yeah. in a telescope. Well, the problem is, because you, the you know, you have such few few points out there, and you have such huge error bars that it's, right. you could almost fit anything you like to it, and, but, uh, except you know it's gone down a bit. But, right, uh, but it's it's, it's, it. it's getting better, and, and is there is, is there a, I mean, how, how, how can it get better? I mean, you're stuck with what nature gives you. It's not like an accelerator. You pick a bill. This, this uh, next month, we're going to be proposing to increase the size of TA, put in proposals I should, I should here and in Japan to increase the size of TA by okay, a factor so that four. Way you might hopefully get more data and yeah. better data. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Thanks. See, my question, maybe it would have benefited other people. Yes, yeah, so they, would, they, they would have liked that. Yeah. Oh, good to get these things over with. What? Yeah, it's good to get the things over with, too. Yeah. Oh, that was actually pretty fun. Yeah, you had a I, couple of good questions. Mm -hmm. Some of the astronomers asked questions. I guess Catherine will come in. This Catherine's? Yeah, that's all Catherine's. That's an HDMI cable. And that's an HDMI map doing it. So is this yours? Nope. That's, that's yours also. Yep. All this is yours. Yep. Yeah, I guess we can at least turn that off. Probably. Maybe not. 